Hello and welcome to Talk to Al Jazeera. I'm Mohamed Ado in Khartoum. And with me is Sudanese President Omar Hassan al-Bashir. He has had a long career that's been mainly defined by war. But to many, he's a peacemaker. He helped end one of the longest wars in Africa when his government negotiated the Comprehensive Peace Agreement with the Sudanese People's Liberation Movement, SPLM, in the South. And now, in the final days of implementing that agreement, President Bashir is staring at the possibility of a separation of his country. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for Thank joining you. us. The split of Sudan is a grave matter. How much responsibility, personal responsibility, are you willing to take for this? As a matter of fact, we have the peace agreement in place. And as you mentioned, we are committed to this agreement. One of the many requirements of the peace agreement, if not the most important requirement, is the right of self-determination for the citizens of the south of the Sudan. Self-determination, no doubt, will yield in either result, voluntary unity or the secession of the south and the split of the Sudan into two states. Definitely, the division of the Sudan will be a painful process. However, at the end of the day, it is the ultimate right of the citizens of the South to decide whether to remain united or to secede. Self-determination. All the, Speaking of it, all the political powers of the Sudan have the consensus that the people of the South should be given the right of self-determination. Opposition convened in Asmara 1995 and yielded in a very important recommendation which is to give the citizens of the south the right of self-determination we the government in Khartoum with all its coalition has taken the decision to give the south the right of self-determination the key reason for that is the absolute conviction of all the political parties that the imposition or the attempt to impose unity by force is a catastrophic process to the whole Sudan and the people, especially the South. So we were the opinion to give the opportunity for a voluntary unity, and it is the choice of the people of the South. If they believe that they are first-class citizens, enjoying all the rights under the peace agreement, they will vote for unity. This was our assumption our and our belief, so long as we implemented the peace agreement, which gave the Southerners more rights simply for the right reason that it gave him the entire rule in, of the South in, in addition to 30% of the federal government in the North. Among the stipulations of the agreement says that both the parties, the Sudan People's Liberation Movement and the National Conference should jo join hands for unity. In addition to the stipulations of the agreement, we initiated development projects. We also established a special fund to support the unity to which we commissioned huge resources and we implemented many and significant projects which we believe that our fellow citizens of the movement will abide by the agreement. However, at the end of the day, the movement took the decision or the option of secession. Can business be as usual here in the north after the separation of the south from the north? Definitely. We firmly believe that the conditions are moving to the better if we look at the south. Since 1995 and the war waging there and the efforts exerted, whether militarily, economically, politically or diplomatically, or even the problems the Sudan is suffering with certain outside forces. The key reason for all that was the war waging in the South. It was an economical, political, security and diplomatic burden, a huge burden. There is no doubt the secession will herald a new era. Now, Mr. President, there's a lot of talk about a military buildup on the border between North and South Sudan. Does this mean a return to war in the case of you two parties failing to agree on the unresolved issues? There is no doubt on our part we did not mobilize any troops on the border lines. However, we noticed that the other parties started to deploy and mobilize 
despite the fact that the security protocol under the peace agreement stipulates that the SPLA forces during the transitional period to be stationed in certain camps without any role to play during the transitional period, simply for the reason that the security in the South will be the responsibility of the police and the issues of sovereignty will be in the hands of the armed forces in addition to the joint forces formed under the agreement which will be in charge under the armed forces. As per the stipulation of the agreement, there are no role for the SPLA troops. However, the positions from which the armed forces withdrew as a result of the redeployment and the agreement, they were taken by the SPLA. It is a matter of precaution and we believe, firmly believe that we will not initiate any assault and we will not try or attempt to impose any status quo on the borderline by any agreements or any issues not agreed upon. Almost 80% of the border issues are agreed upon. The issues or the parts of dispute we agreed with our fellow uh, citizens of SPLM that these points cannot be modified unilaterally. There are certain lands in the south which we believe, according to documents, are part of the north. And similarly, there are territories uh, of the north. They claim it, they, it is part of the south. The uh, situation will remain as is until a final solution is reached. Now, Mr. President, ABA is a time bomb in the agreement between north and south. Do you see a solution to the issue of ABA anytime soon? Again, we firmly believe that President Mbeki offered six options to resolve the issue of ABA. And as a matter of fact, with absolute transparency, he discussed each and every option shedding the light on its positives and negatives and the degree to which it is acceptable or rejected to the parties. He preferred the sixth option and we in principle accepted the sixth option of President Mbeki. The SPLM rejected it and requested or claimed that Abiy should be joined to the south. This matter is not acceptable to us and if any of the parties took any unilateral action in relation to Abiy, this will spark a conflict. So you see the possibility of war flaring up because of ABA? We believe that on our part, we will not take any unilateral action which will result in a war in ABA. And we request the same from our fellow citizens of the South, not to take any unilateral action which will lead us to a conflict. If they uh, observe this, and so we will, there will be no conflict. The key issue is resolved now. The South if it is to secede, a state will be established in the south and it will be a huge achievement to them. And therefore, there is no need to fall in conflict after covering so long distance in terms of peace. Mr. President, could separation of the south be repeated in the future in regions like Darfur, the east, and other parts of the country? Because this is the fear of many people today. Definitely, there is no similarities between the issue of Darfur and other issues in the Sudan. The issue of the South is created by the imperialistic situation, different culture, different ideology, different trend, and different social conditions. It created a psychological barrier between the South and the North. There is ethical, religious, and linguistic difference, which is not exist in any uh, other parts of the Sudan. The issue of Darfur is different from that of the South. These differences are not similar or are not existent in all parts of the Sudan. Recently, your government withdrew its delegation in the Doha peace talks, and you said you are only going to hold negotiations with the fighters, the Darfuri fighters, inside the region. The justice and equality movement, among other rebel groups, have said this is a declaration of war. And so far, there's been no movement in the peace process. What's next? First of all, as to justice and equality movement, they were not a party to the Doha negotiations. They claim to be the sole representative 
of the people of Darfur. They don't wish the government to negotiate with any other party. We state that all the movements in Darfur, including the justice and equality, do not represent the people of Darfur. Now there are certain conditions prevailing in Darfur. Elections took place overseen by observers from the United Nations, African Unity and other European countries. They all testified that it was transparent, free and democratic elections and this was the case in all polling stations. Now there are duly elected legislative and executive councils in Darfur. They are the lawful representatives of the people of Darfur. Yes, there are NGOs who have existence and role. However, the movements were not totally excluded, but they are not the lawful representative of the people of Darfur. We decided that negotiations should not drag forever and no legitimacy will be given to any party carrying arms. If they claim it is a declaration of war, war between us and justice and equality movement since the beginning of Darfur conflict till today has not come to an end. We will take a short break for now and we will be back very soon. We'll hear more from President Omar Hassan al-Bashir of Sudan. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching Talk to Al Jazeera, and our guest today is President Omar Hassan al Bashir of Sudan. Now, you've said recently that you are going to enforce fully Islamic Sharia or law. What does this mean for the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of non Muslims, including Christians, some of them from the south, who wish to remain in the north after the referendum? <laughs> I could say, following the secession, the percentage of Muslims in the north will be about 98%. This is the percentage of Muslims. Definitely 98% have the right to enforce the Islamic Sharia law while safeguarding and preserving the rights of the others. The uh, rights of the others will not be prejudiced. Under the tenets of Islam is to safeguard and preserve the rights of the others, whether the social or religious rights. And as to their citizenship rights, it is totally preserved. They have the same rights and the same obligations. How do you intend to implement the Sharia? Sharia Islamic law is now in place. It is now applicable. The penal code applicable in the north now, it is totally based on the Islamic Sharia law. The civil codes are also in line with the Islamic Sharia law. Totally. They are not only the criminal law, even the civil transaction codes. For example, here in the north, usury is forbidden by religion and by law. No bank can carry out any usury transaction if it is found out by the Sharia supervisory body. This transaction will be revoked, the bank will bear all the consequences, and the individuals who carried out this transaction will be held accountable. Mr. President, according to a diplomatic cable obtained by Wikileaks, the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Luis Moreno Ocampo, has said that you have stashed away $9 billion in foreign accounts. I know you're not a fan of the man, but how would you react to his accusations? I can simply say, anyone can prove that I keep bank account and balances outside the Sudan, I'm prepared to waive and transfer them to him totally. Ocampo, if he has knowledge that I keep balance in an account, I will grant him an official power of attorney to withdraw this amount, but I'm afraid then he will uh, initiate proceeding for issuing a check against insufficient balance. There have been other accusations of the past linking you to corruption. Not long ago, one of your uncles in an interview with a London-based newspaper spoke about hidden businesses run by your relatives. How would you react to those accusations also? First of all, there are no secret or hidden businesses run by any of my relatives. If any of my relatives not member of the government, he is not forbidden from carrying on any business in the market. It is open to all. Anyone has claim of corruption against me or any of my relatives has carried out any act in violation of the law or took advantage of his kinship to me, 
for personal gains or uh, abuse of influence or power, we have in place the Unlawful Enrichment Act, which is clear in its principles and measures. Anyone has the right to initiate proceedings or raise claims before the public prosecution in any matter. However, nothing prohibits my relatives from carrying on their own private business in the market on the basis that or provided that they don't take advantage of my office or their kinship for personal gains. Some of the opposition leaders have spoken of the existence of a plot to overthrow your government using public uprising. Are you worried? Honestly, we don't feel that they have the power or the popularity to take such a move or they expect the people to move its own, the people hasn't. They don't have basis to move either. Well, I will drive an example here. We have elections in universities and as you know, university students worldwide are the category most opposing to governments. Until the nomination has been closed, all the opposition parties have failed to present a slip of 40 students to compete against the slip of the National Conference Party students. All the elections, in all the elections, we had landslide victory against all the parties. I am not underestimating them by impression. It is a fact. If this is the most lively category in society that can move, lead demonstrations and set fire in the streets, now the majority of them are joining the National Conference Party. You've said you're open to the idea of the establishment of a broad-based government after the referendum. While you continue to reject the opposition calls for the establishment of a national government, what is the difference between these two models? Well, the national government is totally different. What are the basis, measures, and weights? Definitely, no one can claim that I am carrying that much weight in the political arena or among the grassroots support at that much if I take part in the government. They sought bases and they found out that their bases have joined the National Conference Party. Some of them continued. Others withdrew on the last day of elections. Now, we have an elected president and we also have an elected parliament. These are the two bodies empowered and authorized by the Sudanese people and they are responsible of leading the government in the coming period. Therefore, the government with the grassroots support, it is the national conference party government to which others can take part in. The other model means equal participation, but there are no criteria for such participation or sharing. We can say that those parties have lost their basis. Finally, Mr. President, do you have any plans whatsoever of stepping down from power anytime soon? Currently, I'm serving an office term, which is known to all, and I will not step down before it comes to an end. After that, the party definitely will nominate its candidate to presidency in the coming period. At that time, I would have completed about 26 years in power. Is that not enough? More than enough. <laughs> Thank you very much, President Omar Hassan al-Bashir of Sudan, for joining us and talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you very much for watching Talk to Al Jazeera.